Barren disease under the church floors was common in Finland from the medieval times to the early 19th century. At first, it was only the wealthy and highly ranked or important members of the society and their families that received the final resting place inside the churches. During the 18th century, the tradition had become more common, which led to crowded spaces under the floors. Building a new church during the latter half of the 18th century often resulted in abandoning the church burial tradition in some individual congregations, since they did not want to harm the newly built floors. They also had become aware of miasmas, the idea of diseases spreading through full-smelling air and fumes, such as from the smelly rotting corpses under the church floors. However, the burial tradition was officially prohibited only in 1822 by a Russian imperial order, 13 years after Finland shifted from being part of Swedish kingdom to an autonomous grand duchy within the Russian Empire. Church people were spirits of the bad people who lived among the skeletons. They could be headless, crippled or wheel-headed or otherwise weird little creatures who hissed and could be smelled. While passing graveyard and church, one needed to greet them. Good evening for the Lord's temple, peace for the living, rest for the dead. These church people needed their peace and were usually awake in the middle of the night. When the church burial tradition ended, all the burial chambers were ordered to be filled with sand. However, this order wasn't always followed and there still are many churches in Finland where the chambers and individual coffins are visible on the ground below the floor planks. Today, this once highly valued and desired burial tradition and final resting place has been forgotten. Only few churchgoers nowadays realize that there may still be old burials beneath their feet and the floor planks when they visit old churches. In this video, we will consider the 18th to 19th century conception of death, deceased people, mummies and church people how they were understood at the time, how they were forgotten, and finally, how they still live in the current Finnish culture, and how we as researchers reinterpret their past and current existence. According to the past Finnish beliefs, before death, individuals used to have two souls. At the time of death, the first soul, called breath, left the body and the other, selfhood, stayed in the body or close by, until it vanished into the soil. This spirit could either be good or bad. The good ones were satisfied and rested in peace. The bad ones were the restless church people. According to the belief of the past people, the human remains we study still had their selfhood present as a sleeping shadow. The coffin was a resting place, furnished as a bed with a pillow and mattress, made from odorous and antibacterial plants, like hay, wood chips, sawdust, common reed, herbs, perch, alder and spruce branches. Folklore states that the spirit needed enough clothes to sleep well in the coffin. Additionally, contemporary people were concerned that the deceased would be too naked and be restless without caps, gloves or stockings. The funerary attire was not functional, but constructed on the human remains from pieces of fabric folded and pinned to look like clothes. The living understood that the body was destined to decay, and the clothes along with it. Coffin was a place to dream peacefully before resurrection. The dead people joined their ancestors in the other world, or underworld, as they called the place where the dead were waiting for the resurrection. The good fragrances help to join God in the heaven, so in a way, the coffin mirrored the Garden of Eden, the hallway to heaven. The peaceful rest was supposed to keep the dead's unpleasant visits haunting away from the life of the living, and the heavenly odors made possible to connect the God. Interpreting and understanding the details of human actions visible in material culture ensures that the beliefs of the past people will become more comprehensible. The beliefs concerning death and the deceased directed the daily life and attitudes towards the fellow human beings, as well as affections, emotions, sense of care and attitudes towards disease.
the dead were something different in contrast to the living. Although the dead once used to be a part of the living world, they had just lost part of their soul, part of their identity. They lived in the other world, and some of them were contrasted the feelings of prejudice and fear. These directed how they were treated. A glimpse of these attitudes is still clearly readable in the current Finnish worldview. Ghost walks and books about the past ghost stories have become popular in many cities, and church people, ghosts, and the past behavior close to the cemeteries are referred to also in the children's literature. Socialization to understanding the presence of elves and ghosts is started in the childhood. Even though everyone knows that such creatures do not exist, nevertheless, ghost stories are still created and reproduced. And while walking in the dark roads, you can easily feel the chilling presence of something that makes you run and scream. The ghost experiences of archaeologists, historians, and other inhabitants at the Finnish Institute of Rome have been studied, which clarifies. That even though the researchers know that the encodements with the ghost inside the building may be logistically reasoned, the researchers take them seriously and do not straightforwardly deny them. It's a concept of thinking of the world, inherited as a part of Finnish culture. Everyone knows ghosts do not exist, but they are believed in, and people expect them to appear. Similarly, as Santa Claus visits Finnish homes every Christmas, these issues are closely intertwined with over generational understanding of self and humanity. The first clear signs of criticism against church burials were from the middle of the 17th century and came from secular authorities, the supreme command of the church and the clergy. The criticism focused on two major things. First, population growth and the spread of the burial custom among lower social classes led to a lack of space under the floors. The second reason for criticism was the full odors that the church burials were spreading. The dead should no longer poison the living. According to 16th century scholars, the smell was sensed in the brain. Inhaling fetid air was considered akin to poison the brain. While the fumes were directly absorbed into the body, these ideas had a strong impact on how the smell of decomposing flesh was experienced in the churches. Because pleasant odors reflected a healthy environment and relationship with God, good smells were used to cover the foul ones. The smells of sin and decay. Unfortunately, the intention to create a bed with heavenly scents. Turned into boxes storing smelling corpses. The bad smells in churches were a warning and a reminder to parishioners about hell and inferno. The smell of death reminded churchgoers of their mortality and the limitness of life. The notion of memento mori, remember that you have to die, was materialized by the sense of smell. No wonder the belief of smelly church people living among the bones was born. However, some individuals, especially those who died during winter months, did not decay or smell bad. Thanks to freezing air and well-ventilated atmosphere below church floors, they mummified. For instance, Vicar Nicolaus Rungius was such an individual. The best-known legend addressing his mummification mentions him preaching that his remains would not decay. Or turn into dust and ashes if he spoke the truth. He would have added that the dry spell wrecking the region at the time would come to its end if the parishioners would sincerely join him in prayer. His mummification must have been miraculous for the contemporary people. The separation between body and soul was not clear, which may have led to the mummification becoming the preferred outcome of burial to aid in resurrection. The next generation only heard stories of the bad smell inside churches, and little by little the tradition was forgotten. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the gravestones in the church floors revealed the locations of the buried individuals and the chambers of families. 
These stones were, however, later removed from many of the churches and the floors were renewed so that they do not any longer show and remind the locations where the floors were opened during the burials. We, as archaeologists, are responsible for sharing our information that we have acquired while investigating the human beings and their material culture under church floors. We are rediscovering once forgotten cultural heritage under floors, interpreting the past conceptions of death and the deceased, and mattering the other world that once used to be important for the individuals buried inside churches. Fear of dead, diseases and church people is visible in many ways in the material we find below church floors. Sheets, clothes and sometimes even the bed in which the individual had died were burned to prevent the dead or diseases from infecting the living. The wood chips from making of the coffin had to be put inside the coffin or burned. The wood chips from the coffins were powerful in witchcraft. They made it possible to carry the dead from place to another. Brooms made from alder and juniper found below floors were used to sweep rubbish and diseases away. In addition to brooms, also other charms have been found on the floors. These include coins wrapped into paper or piece of fabric and then dropped between the floor banks, as well as small coffins for frogs. These coffins were hidden inside churches, possibly to strengthen the spell that would expel bad luck while fishing or reacting to misfortune that was suspected to have been caused by witches. By burying the frog, the witch was hoped to be punished, sometimes even with death. Based on material culture, for us, it is important to understand the past people's conception of the individual in the underworld. Understanding these conceptions is about understanding otherness, the living ones, felt towards the spider spirits, the dead people. Respect for the dead is visible in the burials through the efforts to ensure the deceased a comfortable and beautiful resting place and clothing according to their social status. Respect is also the driving force for our research ethics. Our aim is to study the human remains and the material culture below floors in order to ensure their preservation for the future. Indeed, the preservation is endangered because of recent renovations inside the churches that have activated molding processes. The research methods we have chosen are non or little intrusive. We, for instance, do not open the coffins unless they have been opened by someone earlier. There are stories of people going below floors and looking inside the coffins. For instance, at the beginning of the 20th century in Hauki Buddha's a local man called Gustav Benti visited in the local church and wrote about his fun childhood experience in his memoirs. During his visit, the church floor planks were removed and the vicar of the parish was opening the lids of the coffins inside burial chambers. Bente describes in detail how the deceased looked, showing enthusiastic interest towards the opportunity to get a rare glimpse of the partly mummified human remains. As he wrote, I got a rare opportunity to look into the eyes of the centuries past. While studying the human remains and their material culture through CT scans, photographs and by the coffins, the archaeologists, as representatives of humanity, are dealing with the interface between objectification of humans through chosen methods and subjectification in terms of studying humans as phenomena of humanity, life and nature cultural interrelationship. In our project, Individuals are reproduced through complicated technology of CT scanning, and every time we study the scannings, we are studying the essence of these individuals. The reality of humanity is detectable in the things in humanity, in this case, the conception of death and how they are reproduced in material culture. This humanity we will reproduce in our stories to audiences of different ages. We have been asked to tell about our research to local school children, anyone interested in local libraries or interest groups. It is our responsibility to tell the stories of the past.